Hello and welcome to Castles and Legends. Today we are in Shropshire at Stokesay Castle. It's situated on the road between Ludlow and Shrewsbury and it's also on the border between England and Wales. The castle dates back all the way to the 13th century and it's unique in that the castle has hardly changed since. We enter the castle through the 17th century gatehouse which is the only remaining later addition to the castle. Beyond the gatehouse, we find ourselves in the courtyard, which is surrounded by the remains of the curtain walls. In the medieval period, several buildings, including kitchens and stables, which have now been removed, would have stood around the edges of the courtyard. Let's head back in time to the beginning of the history of Stokesay. When the Doomsday Book was compiled in 1086, Roger of Lacey is shown as the owner of Stokesay, and there is no mention of a castle or manor on the land. In the early 12th century, Theodoric de Say was the tenant of South Stoke. Eventually Stoke and Say merged together and it became known as Stokesay. It is likely that the de Say family also built a tower at what is now the north end of the castle. In 1240, Walter de Lacey died and his son-in-law, John de Verdon, inherited Stokesay. During this era, there was great strife between the English and Welsh and John was a marcher lord that was required by Henry III to live on his estate to counter the threats of Welsh raids. By 1270, John de Verdon had ventured off on crusade and allowed the manor to be let out. In 1281, wool merchant Lawrence of Ludlow bought the tenancy. Wool is considered to have been England's most important export during the later 13th and 14th century and Lawrence was a very successful and wealthy wool merchant. Lawrence's wealth allowed him to invest in land several other manors and property in Ludlow, which generated substantial rental income. Lawrence soon set about building an impressive country house at Stokesay. This was quite unusual at the time. Country houses were normally reserved for the gentry and clearly shows Lawrence had aspirations for his family's status to rise. Since Flewellyn the Last's death in 1282, Welsh raiding had ceased and there was relative peace on the Welsh and English border. Therefore, the house was built more for domestic use and comfort rather than defence. In fact, it is more a fortified manor house rather than a castle. Lawrence's ambitious new project included a new great hall that measured 34 feet high and had a floor area of 52 by 31 feet. This new hall also had windows that were partly shuttered and partly glazed. Glass was extremely expensive at this time, so by having glazed windows, it clearly demonstrates Lawrence's vast wealth. On the south side of the Great Hall, Lawrence built a solar block, a private chamber for himself and his family. The room had large windows to allow plenty of light and warmth from the sun inside. On either side of the fireplace, there are squints, openings that overlook the great hall and allow the family to keep watch on the activities in the hall. In 1291, Lawrence obtained a license to crenellate, that is to fortify his home with battlements from Edward I which he applied to the South Tower, Curtain Wall and Gatehouse. Having battlements on your home had become quite a fashionable status symbol, so this may have been done more for show than defence. A rock-cut moat that was filled with water and a drawbridge were also added. Here we are entering the principal first floor room in the solar block. There was no direct access to this room from the hall for security reasons. Instead, the room is reached by an external stairway 
which was originally covered with a lean-to roof to protect Lawrence and his family from wind and rain as they descended to the hall. The room we see here was completely refitted in the 17th century. The woodwork is Jacobean in style and a ceiling was installed. Next to the fireplace, we can still see those squints or peepholes that allowed the castle's owners to look out and see what's going on in the great hall below. Returning to the story and history of Stokesay itself and Lawrence of Ludlow. Well, unfortunately, Lawrence didn't get to enjoy his fine manor house for long. In 1294, Lawrence was ahead of a consortium of merchants who agreed to raise money from wool exports to finance Edward I's war in France. The fleet of ships carrying the wool set sail to the Low Countries, with Lawrence commanding them. But they did not reach their destination. They were wrecked off Oldborough and Lawrence drowned. Lawrence's family continued the wool business and many generations of the Ludlow family continued to reside at Stokesay, having established themselves as respected country gentry. The last Ludlow heiress married Thomas Vernon. The Vernons were a wealthy Derbyshire family with a higher social profile. Stokesay passed to Thomas's grandson, Henry Vernon. Henry had visions of grandeur and was nearly ruined by his futile attempts to claim the barony of Powys. In 1591, Henry was arrested for debt and he was forced to sell Stokesay Castle to Sir George Mannering in 1596. The record of the sale shows that the castle now had a park attached that was stocked with red and fallow deer. In 1620, Stokesay Castle was sold again to Dame Elizabeth Craven and her son William, who went on to become the first Earl of Craven. William pursued an adventurous military career in Europe, which saw him being imprisoned with Prince Rupert in an attempt to obtain the throne of Bohemia for the Elector Palatine. William was also a staunch royalist, and when the Civil War broke out in 1642, Stokesay was garrisoned on the King's behalf. This is the only time that Stokesay ever saw any military action, although it was rather brief. When the Parliamentarians' armies moved into Shropshire in 1645, Stokesay surrendered without a fight. Stokesay was ordered to be slighted, but got off lightly, as only the curtain walls were demolished. The Civil War ended in 1645, and in 1648, Stokesay Castle was let out to Samuel Baldwin. The Baldwin family took good care of Stokesay and are believed to have helped restore it. It is thought that they installed the panelling in the solar tower and added new windows in the north tower. In 1660, William Craven recovered all his estates after Charles II was restored as king. William and his heirs continued to let out Stokesay Castle to the Baldwin family until the Baldwins left in the early 18th century. Stokesay was then let out to tenant farmers who used the building for farming rather than domestic purposes, which caused the castle's condition to become more and more dilapidated. Disaster struck in 1830. The basement of the South Tower had been converted into a smithy and a fire broke out which quickly spread to the floors above. It was around this era that interest in Gothic architecture was developing and the castle began to become popular with visitors. In 1850, Francis Stacton Acton took on the castle's cause and urged Lord Craven to repair the buildings. In 1855, £100 was spent on clearing and securing the castle, but it was not enough to revert the damage. In 1869, John Darby Allcroft purchased Stokesay Castle 
and set to work on careful repairs. By 1887, the castle was structurally sound and looked much like it had in the 17th century. Allcroft's goal was to preserve the buildings rather than restore them. In 1908, the Allcroft family opened Stokesay Castle to the public. The admission fees they received from visitors were used towards the upkeep of the buildings. As time went on, the maintenance costs became unmanageable and in 1986, Jewel Magnus Alcroft entered into an agreement with English Heritage that saw them become responsible for Stokesay's conservation and would assume ownership upon her death. Between 1986 and 1989, English Heritage carried out a second restoration of the castle and in 1992, the castle came into the guardianship of English Heritage. If you are considering visiting Stokesay Castle, then it is worth noting that Ludlow Castle is only about 9 miles away. And we already have a video on our channel looking at the history of Ludlow Castle. We've really enjoyed our time here today at Stokesay. We've been lucky with the weather, it's chilly but it is January. No rain, so that's the main thing. Now it's just time for me to say goodbye. Thank you so much for watching. Please do like and subscribe to our channel and we hope to see you again on another castle adventure.